I'm talking today to Chitra Subramaniam, a legend in journalism. As most people know, she broke the Beaufort story 25 years ago. Today, we're revisiting it. Why? Because the whistleblower Sten Lindstrom gave her an interview which was published in the Hoot website run by Shivanti Nainan on April 25th. Uh, this was more than revisiting. It has opened up a completely new angle mm -hmm. to the whole story. Uh, but let's start with how you got the story. Mm -hmm. You were in Geneva, heavily pregnant, and you heard this on a Swedish, Swedish radio? radio. That's right. <coughs> the report that there was mm -hmm. corruption in Bofors. Yeah, it was a very simple story. It was, a, it was the Easter weekend, I remember, in April um, 16th or 17th. And uh, it was a story running on um, Reuters. And I had a colleague who had stuck a piece of paper on my, uh, my typewriter. Those days we had typewriters, saying um, the story simply said that Bofors you know, had paid Indians and others to take home their biggest deal. Um, the context, of course, was that it was not the only investigation. Bofors were selling arms to other countries, but the India thing came up as part of that investigation. So, yeah, I didn't break the story. It was the Swedish radio that broke the story. But you picked that up. You just picked up that point mm. and then called Enram of the Hindu. No, Enram, I was stringing for Enram of the Hindu. I was stringing for the Hindu and Enram was my editor. Um, I had also a message from him on the ticker saying he had sent a special correspondent to um, Stockholm uh, and could I assist a special correspondent. So that, that's how it started rolling, the story. And then I began to make my own phone calls. I have friends in Sweden, I have friends in Europe. So that's how the whole thing started rolling. I want to get this, like what it was like for you. You were 29 years old. You're breaking the biggest story. I didn't know. I didn't know. And I mean, I would get intimidated by myself. You Now when I look back, mm -hmm. when I look back, I said, my God, how did I do this? Yeah. Because you were taking on every establishment. But I didn't know that then. Because I genuinely believed that they were good, that we were good people. You know, I come from a family of freedom fighters and extremely distinguished people, so I didn't assume. But you were caught up with the excitement a journalist normally does. Yeah, but I did not say that, you know, I didn't, I thought that the good will, um, you know, win over the evil. I genuinely believe that, and I think it will. So it was. You still think that? Of course. And how were you treated by other journalists? I didn't meet too many. I had friends. Uh, a lot of them um, generally kind, you know, people were kind to me. You know, the funny part is that in those days there was less envy. Yeah, and it's people... It's really funny. Isn't it? Because now when somebody breaks a story, I see more envy than... In the earlier days, it was always like, Hamari Baradri ne, somebody's huh. done this. How did you get uh, Martin Arpo's diary? Was it Sten Lindstrom yeah, who gave yeah. it to you? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And it was translated by a Swedish friend of mine, uh, because a lot of it was in very old, he has a very old style of Swedish writing, so mm -hmm. it was translated by a friend. Tell me, how did this interview with Sten Lindstrom come about at this time? We were I mean, talk, we've been friends. You've been friends for you know, a long time. Well, friends, no, but you know, you talk about other stories and you say, did you see that, did you see this? And um, we were talking about the 25th anniversary approaching and, uh, you know, he's gone on to become a grandfather, my children are grown up, so we were chatting. And then this Columbia thing was sent to me, uh, which was unconnected to what we were, you know, we were talking about. Mm. Um, and then he said it's the 25th anniversary of the uh, uh, media story. It's actually a media investigation. Mm. So, and he wanted to talk, you know, put a face to the voice. So, um, it just, you know, it just happened. It's very simple. It's not complicated. You know, it's also probably now over the years safer. Of course, a safer for him. Manishankar well, Iyer on television was incensed that a foreign policeman has the guts to do this and what standing does he have to make all these accusations? Yeah, but that's irrelevant, you know. I mean, all that is noise, noise pollution. It's irrelevant, you know. And does it get better if an Indian policeman makes an investigation? To me, that's irrelevant. Yeah, of course. And, but, but Stan Lindstrom was, uh, um, he was very much in office when he leaked the documents. And this was not the only uh, story, there were other stories. Uh, that he was working on. 
and, and the cooperation between you know, journalists and him is very, very, very good and very healthy. The investigators came to Sweden. Um, Lindstrom says that whenever the public prosecutor and I heard of any Indian visit, we mm. would speak to the media expressing our desire to meet them. Can you imagine a situation where no one from India met the real investigators of the gun deal? Isn't that comic? That was when we saw the extent to which everyone was compromised. Including in Sweden. There's a book, Madhu, by Mr. Oza. By? Ambassador Oza. Uh-huh. Uh, it's called, I think, The Ambassador's View. Um, and he, nobody has bothered to read that book. And that gives all the details? Of the cover-up, of the start of the cover-up. Of the Beaufort's deal. Yeah, he was our ambassador there. Mm -hmm. And when the story broke... Oh, yes, you've, you've mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. When the story yeah. broke, he called up the Swedes to find out what was going on. Um, and Harish Salve, in an interview, said uh, that uh, a minister was sent to Sweden to tell him that they will handle it and not to get involved. Tell me when uh, Sten Lindstrom knew that this was a plant at that time of Bachchan's name. Why couldn't he have leaked that part of the story? But then? how did he know? Oh, he didn't was, know. How did okay. he know? If you are a, a, a senior police officer and you meet your counterpart from another country, a senior, and you're discussing and, uh, some things and names are given to you and he gives you some names, uh, then do you, uh, you can't assume that it's a plant. It's, an, it's not a done thing. That's very interesting. So they, you just give hmm? the name and, the, yeah. and you say, anyone's name and then yeah. that yeah. That person is and there were other names given also. You know, mm -hmm. everybody had a parchi. Yeah, but the other plant was, uh, national plant was to tell us that the guns were duds. You know, so the story then became, it got distracted. And the investigators, uh, they were worried because they felt, I mean, it was the first time that, um, you know, the Swiss were meeting the uh, Indians. It was a very... Uh, important investigation. When this was happening and you saw that the investigators were not doing mm. the job, mm. did you see that as a story? Did you speak to them about it? How did this, how did you react while it was going on? In the beginning, I didn't know um, what was going on because um, I didn't have the experience of meeting with the investigative team. I did not have that experience. Uh, but um, when I saw the plants happening and I was, you know, running around with my sources saying, did you see this? Is this true? You know, can you prove this? Um, and there was no evidence of that. That's when I began to wonder, you know. And I spoke to people about it. Going back to from Hindu, when you started off doing, uh, working with them, you moved on to uh, um, Indian Express. And the statesman. Yeah, but both. first the Indian Express. No, no, mm -hmm. they came together because both offered to work together, and there were other papers also. In fact, that's unusual. Were, huh? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> but you know, I needed a job, and mm -hmm. the, sto I needed, the story was running. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, other papers also offered, but you know, I, I thought these two could go together. And so the subsequent stories that were being given to you by the Swiss. Then it became the Swiss. Then the Swiss investigation started. Okay. It became then Hindu Swiss stopped Swiss. publishing the story. No, Hindu stopped publishing uh, much earlier. Uh, there was a time gap, but the Hindu stopped publishing for its own pressures. But they they couldn't stop the story and and Stan Lindstrom and others from talking. And I had to print somewhere. And what was your experience like working like that? There were pressures. Yeah. In fact, I thought that when. Uh, uh, Naively, I believe that when B.P. Singh would come to power, the good would happen. You know, like you asked in the interview, are they good people and are they bad people? And, you know, uh, so I thought that the good people will take over and the bad evil will be, the dragon will be killed and all that. And I was a fool. It was yeah. worse, in fact. It was much worse. Yeah. Much worse. You know. Now, when you knew that there were certain journalists who were going after uh, Rajiv Gandhi without evidence, mm. Uh, did you do anything then? Did you speak to them? Mm -hmm. What happened? But, uh, I mean, I was a nobody. You know, I mean, they were very important. I was just a nobody, just a reporter in Geneva. You know. Even then, Chitra, if yeah. you're talking to people and saying, I mean, they didn't listen to you. No, words. this is the whole thing. Was it and the it, hunger just for the story or was there a political motive? For the people? Who, for the journalists? I think it was political. It became, it became a political story. 
It was a political story because it led to the fall of a government. Okay? But that was not the politics. You know, it, I'm talking about politicking then became an important thing. And the alignments, as you said, were all political. Were you threatened ever? Yes. And your family was threatened? My, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, my bank account was broken into. Sorry, your bank account was broken into? Yeah, in Switzerland. How did you do that? I, I, well, I was, I was being paid by a lady called Mrs. Donovan in London. So I went to the bank and I got my, um, you know, you get these monthly statements and I had two salaries. Um, and it was my husband who noticed because he's very systematic and it was coming from London. So uh, I went to court and lost. Because according to Swiss law, um, there was no subjective error on the part of the bank. It was, an, uh, it was not a willful error. It was a mistake. No, so somebody was taking money out? No, no. They were putting money? Mm. Oh, Lord. Mm. And you didn't know who to give it back to? Went to the bank. I sent it back to Mrs. Donovan. I said, whoever has, you know, you know who Donovan is, you give it back. So there was an unknown Mrs. Donovan, Donovan in London who was giving me money. putting money in, in my bank account. account in Switzerland, yeah, in UBS. Have you any idea which side it was? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> was it? Um, let's, no, 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 let's no don't go there. <clears throat> don't. I know, I know, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I this I went to court. It was a big story because you know you, you don't just pay a journalist money. Uh, I had an offer of a bribe, suitcase and all that, you know. You saw the suitcase? I, I, yeah, and I, I didn't, you know, I just asked a person to leave. I was, you know, it, it, when it happens to you, it, it's a shock. And uh, then I came, yeah. I also met a lot of uh, um, international arms dealers, like mm. they were friends, you know, they, uh, you understood how and one of them said to me that, that um, it doesn't matter if, you know, that they are shamed. They don't care. No, they don't. No, because they know that the politicians need them. And they have no reputation to protect the arms dealers. And the politicians have reputations to protect. So um, it doesn't matter. You blame this person. You may, but the, they knew the truth. And I found a certain camaraderie, like an omerta, between these. Um, mm. And I met quite a few, you know. Uh, you had lots of people trying to pressure you into writing the story or holding back the story in whichever way. So you guessed who no, Mr. Donovan I, was? I couldn't hold back. I was just filing. No, but there was somebody was trying to get you to stop or get you to uh, turn the story around. Did you have any idea from all the pressure that you were getting on people who were d different kinds of pressure? Did you figure out who Mrs. Donovan was? And did you speak to that person and no, say... No, no. No, no, because... Um, no, I didn't speak... I, I didn't even know who she was or if she existed. But the money was coming of in. Of course. How much was it? It was... Uh, I can't remember. 6,000, 7,000 francs. Um, I can't remember now. And that was, you know, 25 years ago. You know, little things like that. And then phone calls at night and, and saying, we'll kill your son and we'll do this. And, Funny things. It was it was rough. There was from India calls. From I have India. no idea. And I asked the Indian government for help, um, and they didn't give me any help. So I asked the Swiss government for help, and they helped me. What did they do? They gave you security? No, it was not like a policeman sitting in my house. No, no, no. It's much more subtle. I didn't ask the government, but I, you know, approached people and. There was a, a ring around me and my family. Which and was, your family knew about this? Did your children know about it? No, this? my husband did. He did? He, yeah. How was, your, what, how was your husband reacting through all this while you're going through? In the beginning, um, it was important. Then he got fed up. Um, as I said to you, people um, don't have any respect for space or, you know, your life. And they just think they can, you know, call you at any time and do anything. And, because they're calling from India and, you know, they're so important. Um, it was tense, very tense for him. Um, but uh, he's a mathematician and, a, you know, he, he's an engineer with mathematics and he made all the calculations and helped calculate things. But at one point when I was going to give up because I was just completely fed up, 
he said, you can't stop midway. I want to read the exact quote from Lindstrom. Um, he said to you, the Hindu published them several months after they had them. In the meantime, there was a serious difficulty. I got a message that my name was circulating in Delhi's political circles as the whistleblower. This caused a lot of stress and difficulty for me. You will call the month, you will recall the month, you were not allowed to call me while we investigated who leaked my name as the whistleblower in India. There were consequences for me and my family. The Hindu seemed unconcerned. In this, uh, Enram says that nobody other than the few who needed to know within the newspaper ever asked me who the source was. Not Mohan Khatre, the CBI director who flew in to meet me in Chennai. Not Defense, Defense Minister K. C. Pant who met me and spoke off the record. Not Rajiv Gandhi who discussed, discussed Bofors with me at his re request in 1988. Interesting that when Sten Lindstrom spoke to you, mm -hmm. he said that he chose you to give the story to. There were many other reporters buzzing around. And he specifically said that although he did meet Enram, he would have given the story to you no matter which paper you worked for. Mm. So obviously you inculcated a certain amount of trust and respect in him mm. that you wouldn't uh, fiddle the story mm. and that you wouldn't expose him. These are the two most important things a whistleblower looks for. What happened at that time? Because he had said in the interview that he had problems with Enram because he was sitting on the story, he'd publish a little bit and then months would go by and he wouldn't uh, expose it uh, and wouldn't publish it and that put the whole investigation in jeopardy as well as his uh, identity in jeopardy mm -hmm. in terms of exposure. On the other hand, Enram gives an interview saying that I wasn't sitting on the story, they were giving it to us in stages. Mm -hmm. You uh, have not spoken about it in detail, mm -hmm. but clearly there has been a kind of, because you left the Hindu. Yes, the Hindu stopped publishing uh, the investigation and Enram also left. So there was an internal management problem which led to my leaving the Hindu. And uh, well, Enram said that he was uh, visited by a number of people from Rajiv Gandhi asking them to stop the story and he was under enormous pressure. Which I can understand, but so most of us were under enormous pressure. So yeah. in this case, who was right? I mean, was Enram sitting on the story or did, uh, the, had the stories, uh, when the way they were being given, were they given, being given in stages? We got one pile of documents. Uh, we got piles together. It wasn't as if um, uh, there were not bits and pieces of paper. There was a story being told. And if you look at the documents, put them all on a table, you can't tell that payments were made. They were very cleverly constructed. So uh, it needed an, a lot of understanding of the contracts um, and the payments. But to come back to your question, um, um, sitting on a story and pressure from the Rajiv Gandhi government, you know, I respect all that. I respect the pressure of an editor. There is a space for an editor, which the editor should uh, exercise in a transparent way. When you do a story like this, of course you're going to get pressure. Mm. Uh, that to me is yeah. it's not rocket science. Mm. Um, so that to me is not relevant. What is relevant is that yes, the paper did have the courage to go as far as they did. Um, but I think that a reporter's space is also important. And a reporter's expectations are also important. But Lindstrom also said that when the editor or the newspaper becomes more important mm. than the story, mm. you have a problem. Mm. I'll give you and another, yeah, that sorry. is what happened. Yeah, I think, uh, and that's not only um, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's a constant struggle for reporters who don't own a newspaper. You know, you never know where the editor whose management ends as a reporter or your reporting colleague and becomes a management person. And that line, there'll always be a debate about it. You know, the money coming in, you need, it's an expensive thing, media. And then good reporting. That'll be a constant debate. He wrote this article for, article for Columbia uh, mm. Journalism. And uh, he took the full credit of it, of the story, in that your name was not mentioned. In fact, in one of the comments, somebody had mentioned that the story should have been, the byline should have been Chutra Subramanian. Secondly, recently, uh, he kind of diluted your role in it. He said there were many people 
who worked on it. There was Manoj Joshi, there was Malini Parthasati, there were all uh, kinds of people, and himself who worked on it. Madhi, you've been an editor. You started the India Today group. You know, I don't need to talk journalism to you. And um, you just outlined what happened. Why I don't get credit or get credit is, it's for the public to decide. You know, I'm not getting into uh, why, uh, why uh, it's, it's considered one person's story, as it was in the Columbia thing. You left Hindu mm. at the time when the pressure was really seriously on um, to stop publishing the mm. Beaufort story. Um, was, Enram, <clears throat> was Enram seriously going after Rajiv Gandhi? I don't know that. And it would be unfair for me to say anything. Uh, you know, I... Because he, has, he said he had visits from three senior people from Rajiv Gandhi. Which I, I believe, mm. you know, uh, I'm sure that happened. And, uh, but then what did you expect? When you're doing such a big story, you will be visited by, uh, you know, and that is not pressure for me, as far as I'm concerned. You know, you, you are not, uh, you are, you're following journalism, and if you are being pressurized by people, you know why they're doing it. So that to me is a, is a detail. That is kind of expected. I of mean, course. Yeah. What was Enram's reasoning to you when he was holding back uh, the story? A, that, um, see, for, for example, um, this has to be, when you got, when you have a piece, one paper, one diary, we didn't have the whole diary, we had pages. If the, if the page said uh, that meeting in Geneva with Gandhi, trustee lawyer, it doesn't need translation. There was just one line or due diligence or whatever, mm. because you trusted the source to start with. So uh, that one page was held back. So were the notes, Martin Adbo's notes. Uh, and there were not many pages. And they, that did not require due diligence and um, you know, once you trust the source and then you do your due diligence once. Uh, uh, reasoning was that I did not um, understand the political, uh, uh, you know, the political parameters of this. And that you was, didn't understand? Yeah. You were told. So obviously there was a, a political sort of uh, pressure being put. How can I say that? What is my evidence to say that? But it is a fact that, you know. The story was held back. Yeah. For whatever reasons, but they were not journalistic reasons. That they, you know. Well, why do you hold back one page? Such an explosive page. And did you That's give that the page only time. to Indian Express and States? No, no, it, it was with the, with the Hindu first. I mean, it was the first time that the Gandhi name had been mentioned in all the documents. And, you know, I remember getting it and feeling, you know, strange. And finally it came out? It came out finally. From the Hindu? Yes. But I think um, what one sees of Enram, he gets seriously involved in the stories, doesn't he? More so than any other owner. I have only the experience of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gets seriously, yeah, he, I mean, he also did journal, good journalistic work. But the challenge for uh, me was at, you know, when was the journalist speaking and when was the management speaking, you know? Uh, that was a challenge. Who did you actually meet? Did you meet Rajiv Gandhi? No. VP Singh? Rajiv Gandhi I met as a journalist, but years no, ago. Yeah. But not related to both. No, no. VP Singh? Yes on this issue? Yes, and I asked him to give me those 14 names. You know, he had this name. Yes, list. He had a list which he would take out. So I asked him to produce that list, which never happened. And to be frank, I, I admired him. You know, I was taken in. I mean, don't forget, I was 29. And you know, here was Rajiv Gandhi when he, when, when he made that speech in Bombay, when the Congress About cleaning turned, up the party. Yeah, when the Congress turned 100. I mean, I really thought, finally, we had somebody who made so much sense. Um, and then when the problem was when the Beaufort story broke, he said that neither his family nor he or his friends were involved. And that was a giveaway because there was no, um, absolutely no accusation against him. It was just that Indians were involved at that point. We didn't know who they were. Mm. But then there was this whole thing, you know, 10 questions a day and 
uh, he was pilloried for all kinds of things. From Ram Jait Milani. Yeah, you know, and it got extremely vulgar. So what happened with VP Singh when you asked him for the list? I mean, it was, people joked that he actually had a grocery list over there. Uh, maybe, probably. Um, but he said to assist the um, uh, investigators. And then I had a problem because, um, you know, when you start assisting an investigating team, you don't become, you lose your journalism um, limits. So I traveled with them on their first visit to, to, to Switzerland. Introduced with the investigating team? Yes. I was going back. Uh, it was a personal visit. And, okay. then I, and then I introduced them to everybody. And they were funny. Lots of, I mean, it was remarkably funny. You know, I can't speak on television, but funny things happened. You know, simply. Tell us a teeny weeny one. <laughs> teeny weeny one was showing up late for an official dinner because the sun, you know, sun sets and it's, it's light still. Uh, oh, they didn't realize. <laughs> I was a din you know. About VP Singh, you also said that nothing happened during VP Singh's regime. You met him, you said. What did he do? We, I just met him uh, once or twice, maybe Did twice. you talk about Beaufort's to him? Of course. And what did he say? That, he, that the best people, uh, were, that, that his government had put the best people on the job. Hmm. Yeah. And then he made a, then he made a statement uh, that he would have the names in 14 days. So then we thought that he actually knew something hmm. that we didn't know. So we thought that this would be, you know, uh, uh, done very quickly. Mm -hmm. Because if he had, uh, 14, if he could guarantee that it, 14 days, it's impossible. He gave the impression that India knew much more than what the journalists working on it knew. That's the impression I had. And then nothing came out? No. That is shocking. Well, you made that statement in the beginning of the, somewhere in the interview that there were, you know, political alignments began to form and unform and mm -hmm. that's what happened. You told Star News that um, VP Singh, the VPC government, Singh government put pressure on you mm. to include those names. Mm. And when you refused, mm. they started maligning you. I didn't say that exactly, but it's it's a fair it's a fair assessment of what I said. Those were not I don't remember, but it's a fair assessment. And so, did you in any form? I mean, you could expose that at that time. Uh, I that, did. That pressure was being. Put I did. On. I did. I distanced myself. I did. I did. I spoke to journalists. Uh, and told them that this is happening. Oh, absolutely. And there were lots of stories about of Keystone Corps. And oh, yeah, there was, oh, yeah, absolutely. Don't forget, I had a lot of busybodies visiting me, you know. OK. Everybody had their list. Everybody knew somebody had a Swiss account. And you know, everybody knew everything about everybody. Um, and it was not my life. You know, I had a life. Mm. It, thank God I was not living in Delhi. And um, no, no, I, people wrote about it. Even for the six years that the BJP was in power, they could have questioned. They could have closed as far. I mean, I don't know how governments work, but they could have uh, certainly. They could have. They had. They had enough time. Uh, and don't forget, I think they had the defense minister. You know, there were, there were ministers. There, were, there was the law minister who were you know prominent players in in, in the call for justice on mm -hmm. Bofors. And uh, uh, you know, it was it, it was like nobody had any interest. Nobody had any interest in this. Or oh, the other way around. Everybody had an interest. Yes, yeah, they had yeah. their own interest. Yeah. And it's something that I read um, that Mr. M. J. Akbar wrote, and I really greatly admired his writing. He wrote something about, he said that it's, uh, it's everybody's fault, so it's nobody's fault. Something mm. like that. That's what happened. Mm. And this is dangerous. This, the, the fact is that here everybody had some aspect of, mm. to protect, and another one and another person to point the finger to. And if you see that, the only person actually who, to me, comes out looking all right is Arun Singh, mm. who resigned and left. And has never spoken about it. And has never spoken about yeah. it. But the problem is that it's also giving up. He could have also fought it or exposed it. And then we, in our mind at that time, when we were covering it, VP Singh looked like that kind of a guy. He was the guy who fell out 
of Rajiv Gandhi, with Rajiv Gandhi because he was exposed to the corruption on Bofors. Before that, there was a submarine deal, the HCW. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it looked like he was the one who mm. was going to be the savior of India. Mm. I mean, it's hard for, for me to believe that we all did believe that. No, but that's okay. That's how he won the election. No, but that's okay. I mean, I think if you, if, you know, some amount of naivety is not a bad thing. You no, know, then I, you become I'm a, a professional cynic. naive person because I you know, work on it. You have to keep that. Otherwise, you become but a cynic so, yes. and you say nothing matters, this doesn't matter, so what? I think when, when, when journalist makes mistake, um, it's, it's okay. You've got to own up and you say, you know, I didn't know and I'm sorry, I'm only human. Hmm. Um, and all of us were naive, you know. One very interesting factor, on, because of course Arun Nehru was interviewed when this broke, um, and I find that this is a rather, may sound ethnocentric, but a rather an Indian argument in which they say, well, why now? So Arun Nehru says, look at the timing of now, as if whenever it comes out, if you raise a suspicion mm. on why the person is doing it, it's enough. And the motive. Exactly. So it becomes a motive mm. if you raise the, the timing, that mm. why are they coming out with it now 25 years later? Mm and look at the timing mm. and so therefore there must be a motive. Mm. So again they're putting a motive on you and Lindstrom. Mm. Which is fine, I mean. No, it's not fine. No, it doesn't bother me. It clouds it. It clouds it. It clouds it. It clouds yeah. the real issue. And there are people who read things at face value. Have you any idea when VP Singh left Rajiv Gandhi's government, there was a fallen, falling out uh, between Rajiv and Arun Nehru also. Then Arun Nehru joins Rajiv Gandhi, um, VP Singh's government. Then they're in cahoots together on the same thing. Um, it seems like there were new alliances formed on the basis of, of Bofors. Mm. And I think that's a pity. I think it, that was a tragedy. Because already, look what you've just said. You've said that there were new political alliances formed on the basis of Bofors. That's a story. It was not, it's, it was not a political story. Exactly. You know. We, it's a we, mafia story. We, no, we got go, a good gun and we, for a good price. And the spin, the problem was the bribes. Arun Nehru's role, did you know about it then? When I went to meet Arun Nehru, um, he asked me more questions than I did. Interesting. Such as what? Um, you know, what did I know about, about Martin Arbo? You know, he asked me more questions than I. Did Martin Arbo mention me? Did he ask you that? He, he I, yeah, and I said yeah, and I said yeah, I recall meeting him. So he took it on and dismissed it. You know, and said he didn't meet him. No, no, he didn't deny the meeting. Acha. But he said it was not for this, and you know. So I got the sense. And I told Ram that I got the sense that he was asking me more questions. To show how much, to get, figure out how much you I know. Knew, yeah. And how much more of the story is going to come out. Mm. So when you figure that out, did you stop giving him any information? I was never giving anybody, I was never giving any Indian politician any information. You stopped answering his questions and start, started well, asking him The meeting him was some. brief because yeah. I, I got uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, I, you know, when I, re I, I was also scared towards the end. Yeah. Because I didn't know what was going to happen. By which time my parents were scared. You know, I have an Italian because family. Giving but the stories out in stages is mm. a very dangerous thing to do. I think so. When you're sitting on uh, something as. Yeah. Because the people who are, will be affected know, right. know that something is going to come out about them. And all of them are worried, so it puts you at huge risk. Mm. Which is why, like, the Hell Cup brought the story out all mm. in one day. Yeah. And that was it. I don't know if, if on a breaking story, which it both was, was, if you can put everything out on the same day, because it was breaking in bits and pieces. But I thought that the delays were not journalistic. Especially for uh, the, um, the time, that, the only time that the Gandhi trustee lawyer was mentioned. You know, the Gandhi's name was mentioned. That was That's when it stopped. And it's just a page. It's just one page, not even a page. It's one sentence in a diary. Let me ask you uh, another question to this. Um, um, the evidence stops at Kwatroki. Um, 
and if there was a, a, another, if there was a further passage, uh, it's for the government to figure that out. The journalistic investigation stopped at Quatroki. And this is not the job of a journalist then, hmm. you know, to become also a judge. My question is, why didn't we just follow the money trail till we could and then question people on that? Why was uh, Quatroki paid? The company, have you read the A That's service? That's the most important question have you, actually. Have you read the A services contract? No. I'll, I'll, it's, I'll send it to you. Okay. It, there is nothing, there is no work done. It doesn't say I will do this, this, this. And he this. came in at the, this company came in at, at the, the last, last minute. minute. Yeah. And that's, so that, that was is odd. Why, well, th that's what is called a political payment. And, and Ma Martin Arbo mentioned that he was almost forced. He didn't have a choice. That he knew that he'd lose the contract. Yeah if he didn't pay AE services. Yes. Along and, with and Chadda and... Yeah, who had Hindu done Jaffa. a lot of work. Yeah. If, you, if the real intermediary was Mr. Chadda, who's also no more. Hmm. He was the one who was running around and he did all the work. But uh, the interesting thing about AE services is not only does it come in the last minute, doesn't do any work, but guarantees Bofors that they will get the contract within this period of time, failing which they don't have to be paid. Now you tell me which um, arms dealer has this kind of power. When you talked about this Gandhi trusted lawyer in trusty Geneva, lawyer. Mm. that's a fact. Mm. Payments were made to this Gandhi trustee lawyer. I don't know that. There was a meeting. Uh, Between Nehru? No, there was a meeting. There's a diary entry uh, of Martin Arbo that there was a meeting between AE services and a Gandhi trustee lawyer in Geneva. At, a, at Rue de Rothschild, I know the address. So that meeting took place. And there was no name? I think the CBI has a name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is there a problem in actually giving the name? No, I mean, I have no um, mandate to give it out. You haven't talked about the postman. I think it was, yeah, I think it was Mr. Sukram, yeah, who showed up in Davos. Uh, I want to get my facts right with a letter, and he, he just, he um, tried to give this in letter to the uh, Swiss foreign minister to stop the investigation. To stop the investigation. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? So it was promptly leaked to me. Promptly leaked to me. Arbu had mentioned that Nehru could be revealed. Arun Nehru could, but not Q. Q. Hmm. Because of the proximity to Rajiv Gandhi. Mm -hmm. That to me is almost like clinching evidence. Madhu, you know, whichever way you roll the dice, Whichever way you want to look at it, you will land on this question. No, but the worst is here, uh, the, where, no matter how hard the evidence might, might point, look at the brazenness of it, that in spite of what has been happening, questions have been raised, in spite of that, the guy, the brazenness of leave, being allowed to leave the country, or in fact, being possibly being advised that you're Passport is going to be impounded, being told that, mm. and you better take off tonight. Mm. The brazenness of the accounts, brazenness of de not freezing, defreezing, brazenness of not sending the CBI uh, team properly and giving the right evidence to re-arrest him mm. in in uh, Argentina. All this, and, and you pile it up, only points to one person. Yeah, one more point. The contracts were. It was very cleverly done. Nobody except a handful knew the whole story. And the other players thought that they knew the whole story. So mm. a lot of people discovered, the people you mentioned, they discovered that they didn't have the whole story. Uh, so imagine working on something as important as this and seeing other, other facts coming up, of which you had no idea. Now the entry on uh, Quatroki's description given to Interpol, by the CBI is like this, height not known, color of eyes not known, distinguishing marks not known, color of hair not known, characteristics not known. <laughs> and they're giving this as information on how to catch the guy. Mm. So isn't this an, in, I mean, isn't this an amazing? That's what I'm saying. So there's so much for journalists to go on. Yeah. That if you just look at the official papers. But it needs work. The it needs work. And that's why I use the word lazy. Hmm. Because it's true. It's true. Because this kind of going and 
getting documentation. If you can get them, why can't anybody else? You know. Quatroki is gone, escaped, and that by itself he was quite was allowed, remarkable. He was allowed to escape. Well, look at the just look at the facts. First, this Argentinian story where he is arrested because of the red corner notice by Interpol uh, in a Gazoo airport or mm -hmm. something. Uh, kept there for two days. CBI is informed over here. Um, he's they barely oppose bail. He's let off. The the kind of representation and the facts they presented were almost deliberately half baked to let him go. His accounts are defrozen by uh, on India's request and on our ma taxpayers' money. Money and defrozen just before they were actually, any decision was going to be taken. July 29th, th the night of July 29th, 30, when, he, when the CBI had just asked for his uh, passport to be impounded, he leaves from a major airport. All these things are happening, that the money is, he's got his money, he's gotten out, about to be arrested, even when he's arrested, the CBI doesn't object to it. And then finally, Milan Banerjee, makes a statement that it's an embarrassment to have a red corner notice out for him mm -hmm. and asks for it to be withdrawn. I mean, it leads each act by the CBI, which is obviously an instrument of the ruling party, has been to protect him. Mm. That's clear. Now, how, how can we ignore, you think, with the facts as they are, how can we ignore that Arun Nehru was a player there, his name is mentioned by three people in the diary. He's in India, he hasn't run away. Why are they all protecting each other? I think the answer to that is quite simple. I think everybody has a stake in protecting each other. And uh, I mean, I can use words which are unparliamentary, but I think nobody wants the truth of, of this to come out. Let's For a whole lot of reasons that I now, ignore. Now, Sten Lindstrom has come out with the truth that Amitabh Bachchan's name was planted by the investigators mm -hmm. during VP Singh's time. Mm -hmm. So now we understand why VP Singh stalled the Bofors investigation during his regime, so that that plant wouldn't come out. He didn't care that the Bofors exposure, although he won an election by maligning Rajiv Gandhi, he knew that if he invest, if the investigation went further, and he may not be able to control the, the Swedes, that the plant of Amitabh Bachchan and Rajiv Gandhi's name would come out, meaning the, that his investigative team planted it. So we now understand that why VP Singh stalled it. Why did the BJP stall it? The BJP stalled it, to my reading, again, because somebody from the BJP who was part of the investigating team also was part of planting the story during VP Singh's time. So now we have three parties who are all claiming that they want an investigation, but it'll never happen because each one of them has to protect themselves for a different reason. So we're stuck. Today? Today. No, we're not stuck. Tell me. No, no, we're not stuck at all. Uh, okay, if you want to say, there are two things we can do because as a nation. In this coalition, it's not going to happen because of... No, but then... Uh, this is what it comes to. I mean, th is, this, is this the India you want then? And, you know, people have to ask, we have to ask ourselves qu questions. Okay, 64 crores is nothing. You know, people tell me it's nothing, it's chicken feed compared to what goes on today. That is not my problem. The problem is that, uh, you know, I think there has to be a catharsis. And in the recounting of the facts and what happened, as you said, the whole generation has heard this word back and forth like a football, but doesn't know what really happened. Mm. I think there has to be a cold recounting of the facts. Whether you punish somebody or you don't punish somebody, it's too old, all that. But there has to be a closure, you know. And as when, um, when the newspapers were going after Rajiv Gandhi, and you knew that it was a plant. Rajiv Gandhi was uh, not a plant and nobody, he, he was the... Um, Umbrella who watched and did yeah, nothing. Yeah, and as remember, Lindstrom said, that yeah. he saw the cover up. Absolutely. Uh, but he did nothing. Well, some, you know, something as simple as uh, uh, when I think it was Sundarji who said we can threaten, threaten to cancel the contract if they don't cough up the names. Um, two of the top, topmost people came down to India to give the names to Mr. Gandhi, um, and Mr. Gandhi uh, said that he didn't want to meet them because whatever he said would have been misconstrued. 
something that Mr. Manish Shankar Raya also mentioned that. Mm. But then I, I don't see why there could not have been a committee to which, after all, we were the people who were buying the guns. We were the ones who were more important than uh, two Swedish officials. Why, why could we not have, we could have told them, you give the names to this group of people. I mean, are, are we then saying that there are not three people that we trust? It was a fight against upright officials who believed in our institutions and in our systems. Um, I happen to know General Sundarji very well. I think we're even related. Um, and he, um, uh, he said two things. And I had, in my book, I wrote it. He said that um, he had spoken to Arun Singh um, about this. And Arun Singh said that all this was being done to save the skin of one man and never mentioned who that one man was. So it was left like that. Uh, the general also said that we could, you know, threaten Beaufort to come out with the names. And if, it, if we have to go for cancellation, the second option, the SOFMA, we, we could, you know, we could activate that without any uh, fear of national security being undermined. So it wasn't as if good assistance was not available and good advice was not available. So, you know, there was the money part, but for me, that is a bad part, but look at the damage to the institutions. You know, every institution was starred, the judiciary, the executive, even the army wasn't spared. When the story broke, there were opposition. They all started doing the usual drama, and they began to question the gun. The gun was an excellent gun. It was state of the art, it had this shoot and scoot, you know, and I couldn't understand. And the good part was all this would come to me five days, six days later. And I couldn't understand why we were questioning our defense decisions then, you know. So it became, going back to your answer, it became like almost a clear divide. So there was Arun Singh who gave up, threw his hands up and didn't want to be part of it, knowing everything that was going on. Sundarji, who tried to keep his head above water because he wanted his gun, his Bofors gun. Uh, then there was this clearly Arun Nehru who was in Martin Arbor's diary and also called by Stan Lindstrom as, as the Amy Nozries. No, he was not called by Stan Lindstrom. Martin Arbo told him if you that look he's the eminence. Amy Nozries. And Stan Lindstrom repeated it in your yes. interview. It starts with Martin Arbo who in this interrogation and you've got to realize that the interrogation was not like it's done here. You know, slap somebody. It's it's a conversation like we are having. And people wait. They don't assume that Martin Arbo is guilty or somebody else is guilty. There's some dignity you know, in helping people understand. And uh, uh, once, once the cover-up got on from India, the Swedes just followed. And Martin Adbo saw all his friends disappear, one by one. Um, and he was alone. Uh, and he said he will take the truth to the grave. Unfortunately, he's no more. And Stan Lindstrom met him about two years ago or three years ago. You know, they were talking because people need to yeah. get things out of their system. If the decisions are being taken behind the scenes through the CBI by just Ishara, how can you even go after that person? Is there any other thing that the journalist could do? I mean, nobody's going to get an interview, that's for sure. No, I think the journalist should construct the whole story like you've done. Fact after fact, you know, source after source, construct it uh, and, and ask the questions. I would like to say that, you know, we need to have a, you know, documentation and just either close this or catch the guilty because this can go on and it will go on. I mean, it's the first time that the Prime Minister was, you know, accused. Somehow, justice has obviously not been done. Mm. Things are still, in fact, worse. Mm. The worst have gotten away with it. And... Uh, like you said to me a year ago, you know, and I mean, I, I need to say that, you know, I've always admired what you've done. You've broken path for Indian journalism. You created space for magazine journalism. You created space for television journalism. And you told me last year when we met that in India today, it is almost sub subversive, to be honest. Yeah. And I've used that a lot. Yeah, you get shafted. You get shafted if you're in a department and you're the only honest person, you're in trouble. So... So what does... What does this say? That something is going to give? Now, you said that every government from 1990 used Bofors for petty personal and political gain. Mm -hmm. People who came to power on the Bofors platform were among the first. 
to procrastinate while they pretended to investigate. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, considering the historical background of these three coalitions that have happened and we have gotten nowhere, you can say that even now, even if the Congress party loses the next elections, even the next uh, coalition, I would presume, would not go after Bofors. What do you think? No, but, but shouldn't we as journalists break that thing that this government will do this and that government will do this? Shouldn't the, I mean, this might be naive and childish, but shouldn't the facts be allowed to go where they are going, whichever government is in power? I mean, how do you build an accountability? then we say this government will not investigate that person, that government will not do this. At the end of the day, um, what does it do to us? How do you see it going forward? I think it really depends on the media. This story depends entirely on the media and how, how far, because the government, whichever government, as we spoke about, that no government is interested in exposing the real truth. We certainly can't depend on the CBI, which is, you know, going to ta only take orders from whichever government is in power. And uh, it's been proven that all of the three major parties who did not want the truth to come out for their, to protect themselves. So I think the media really has to pick up the cudgels now and do some real investigation, some real work. Some real footwork. Yeah. If we want, I don't know where it's going to go, like you said, it'll just die off, like many things die off, they come up for two days and then they're finished. Or um, some serious people just sit down uh, and tell the story to the nation mm -hmm. and talk to Stan Lindstrom. And he will tell what, you know, he will tell the story. Uh, okay. And it doesn't matter if people are sent to jail or not, but it'll show us for what we are. Mm -hmm.